Hello, it's Andrew Dolan. In this video, we're going to be talking about PLC inputs and outputs, and specifically the addresses that are used inside the software and this little thing called controller tags. So, uh, in previous videos, we had shown you how to connect the PLC to a computer, how to create a new project, and got a little bit familiar with the inputs and outputs. Now in this video, we're going to be talking about the controller tags and how do we pull up the addresses for these. We had a sample of it in some previous stuff, but let's get into it. So in the software, this is an example of a previous, or a previous example program I had pulled up from our PLC hardware. And it's showing up here as local uh, slot 1, um, I for inputs, and data 0. So the way we pulled that up was, you know, I think we added an element to this. I wonder if I can just delete that out of there. Oh, let me take it out of run mode here. So I'm going to go offline, and now I can edit these things. So from that pull down menu that's shown here, this is how we accessed these things. This is a local um, slot number one, which would be the embedded inputs and outputs. And embedded means that they're just built into the PLC as opposed to being an, expan an expansion or uh, a module that you'd add on over here. Embedded means they're integral. They're all included in the same part number here. So those are built-in ones, and they happen to occupy slot 1. That's why they're showing up in our software over here as, as such. So um, local slot 1 inputs. These are the embedded inputs for our PLC. And then I was able to go to the data tab, and this is where each individual input and output is showing. So if I were to change this to um, number two over here, uh, that would basically be I2 of the embedded inputs outputs. And if I look at my schematics from prior, I2 would be uh, an E stop push button that's connected. Um, to the controller. So that's one way to reference these things. Uh, let's get into a tab over here that's called controller tags. So if I were to click on our controller tags, that's where I can see a list of all of the inputs and outputs for this controller and some of the expansion modules. So the I1s that we were talking about are located over here, and here's the I1 um, data. So this basically, data 0 would be input 0, as we would call it from our schematics. So that would be input 0, this green push button, I0. That's what's physically wired up to it. Um, the selector switch would be on I3, and etc. But they show up here under our controller tags, and that's how they reference them. Now, that's great. Um, and if you're looking at a main program, OK, that's interesting. It gives it a name and all that. But how do we know it's actually connected to it? And that's where it's interesting where we can create uh, aliases or tag names that are more representative of what we actually have connected to the devices and use those instead. So we can go down here. Um, actually, before I get into get creating aliases, I apologize for that. I'm going to back up. And I'm going to click on a thing called monitor tags. OK. So here's this whole bunch of inputs here. And I can click on the monitor tags and then show you guys the status of these things. Now, right now, the they, PLC is in an offline mode. So if I want to monitor them and see how they're doing inside the software, I have to go online. So I'm going to go ahead and go online. And I'm still under this monitor tags business. Let's hit download, I guess. OK, so now once I'm online and I can see the status over here, I'm in a remote run mode, 
uh, I can press my green push button and these indicators show up over here. This is uh, the green push button on, on input zero, right? And a black push button on input one. And that emergency stop uh, mushroom head, if I press it in, I get a zero. If I pull it out, I get a one. I've got selector switches on here. So I can toggle these things on and off. And that's kind of interesting. Now, this is showing up over here as data types. And it's a good idea for us just to cover some of these things straight away and start learning data types. So in computer programming, a Boolean can only be a 1 or a 0. It's on or it's off. Now, you see how this is a group for the local input, uh, local 1 input data. And that happens to be an integer. An integer can store um, 16 bits of information. So it's kind of interesting when we're looking at these bits over here. Each one of them holds a specific spot in the program. So I want you to see right now all of my inputs are zeros. And if I were to toggle on the green push button, it's going to convert that one into a 1. And note the location of that. We would call that the least significant bit. And this whole grouping that you see here, all 16 bits, each one of them is stored uniquely inside the software. And so if I press this um, black push button, which happens to be hooked up to input 1, you'll see it toggling there. And if I pull out the e-stop mushroom head, it's located here. Each one of them is progressively larger. So to help out with this, I'm going to pull up a calculator. And I'm going to change the calculator type from the standard or scientific in Windows into a programmer type. And then there's a bunch of strange things here that are listed as binary. Decimal numbers are what we are most accustomed to seeing. But computers store things in ones and zeros. So when I select binary over here, I just see ones and zeros. It's the only option, the only digits we have. So this is a lot like what we see here. If I click on this little guy, it's the toggling, the bit toggling keypad. And I'm going to change this to a single word, which is similar to an integer. So this whole group down here across the bottom of the screen would represent an integer. And if I were to toggle these things on and off, I can see the result of that. So that'd be the similar thing like toggling input 0 on and off. This would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I can toggle each one of these on and off. And basically, each one of them would represent an input. So this is a, a precursor of things to come that a whole group of 16 individual bits represents an integer. An individual bit is called a Boolean type. It can only be a 1 or a 0. So the same thing is actually happening inside here. There's 16 bits in this uh, input 1 data. They represent an integer data type. And each one of those represents an individual input on the PLC. So I'm toggling those things on and off. So again, that's all well and good. And it's kind of a useful troubleshooting tool to be able to see this. But let's get into some other details. Now, those controller tags, if I went to edit tags, uh, again, this is really cumbersome to think that, OK, Input um, input zero. That's local one i data zero refers to this green push button. Wouldn't it be cool if we could just give it a nickname that was relative, that meant something more to us? So let's do that. And we can do that by creating 
um, different tags in here. So I can say green, oops, uh, BTN for green button. Okay, so I can in here I can create and edit tags and I can give them nicknames for other things. So uh, in this case, I'm going to choose a Boolean data type, and it's going to be an alias for some other input over here. So I think I have to go offline in order to really edit these tags. Yep, now when I'm offline, I can go in there and say, you know what, that local input, um, you know, these strange names that don't mean much of anything to us, local slot one input data zero is now going to be from here to for known as the green push button. All right. So creating that um, a tag that means something, it basically says that's an alias for this. So instead of typing this out in my program, I can substitute green button, which means something more to me. So instead of having it called out like this, which I don't know, that's just the input number that's there. I can just type in green push button and it pops up as an alias for that. And it should behave the same way as it did before. In a similar way, if I go back to edit my controller tags, I had a green LED. Ah. And I can choose this green LED once I change it to a Boolean type and say, you know what, that's, um, that's going to be that local output module over here. And there's the data. and. I know that my green LED was hooked up to output zero. Okay, so just showing that in here, here's the green uh, LED, light 121 as it's shown in the schematic. It's a green LED hooked up to output zero. So back to this, that is the address for output zero. And I've given it an alias or a nickname uh, tag here of green LED. So instead of calling it out like this, which means nothing to me, I can edit it and say that this is the green LED. And it's a nickname or an alias for that address. So I'm going to download the program. Download. It should pop it in there. Done Let downloading, go into run mode. Sure, let's do that. And in here, the program behaves the exact same way. It's just that now it has uh, the aliases in there, which are a little bit easier to use and call up instead of having to go back to their home addresses and uh, a neat thing too, you can monitor these inside of when you're in remote run mode. Um, we can see as they're turning on green here, they would turn on over here while it actually is operating. So the, that means it's live and functional. That's pretty cool stuff. So those are a, a nice thing to see that we can rename the tags based on what they're actually doing in the schematics. Excellent. Um, one other quick thing that's worth talking about here would be it's called forcing on the inputs and the outputs. So rather than having to write a program to make it do something, if I want to test and see is that output functional or can I just turn on that output, the software allows you to do it's called forcing them on. So let's take a look at that. So right now you can see the green LED is in its off state over here. And if I right click on that element, I can choose force on, okay? And right now this forces shows up over here, IO forcing, and I can click on enable all forces. So you can see there's a little on that showed up in purple over here. 
this bit is being forced on. And if I click this enable all IO forces, it says, do you really want to do that? Because here's the thing, stuff is going to start up. I'm going to click yes. And when I look at the PLC output over here, this LED in that bottom corner there is actually turned on now. And it's not on because of the programs calling it on. I'm forcing it on through the software. So that's interesting. Uh, it's a neat troubleshooting tool, but be aware if you're telling a motor to start, you have to, it has to be safe to do so. So there is a risk to forcing things on and off. And I can remove all IO forces and then that light will turn off. So that's a neat thing to be able to um, enable and disable all those forces. So that's a, a great place for, for us to end this particular video section. But we've uh, gone through and seen how we could um, access the different inputs and outputs using their their addresses that they use by default that are listed kind of archaically like local one input data zero okay and then how we could create tag names for them and give them nicknames that are more useful for us that would indicate well what's it connected to what's it going to do um, those tags are a preferred way to document your program and say oh this is actually controlling this. So instead of looking at some strange name that doesn't mean anything to anybody else, um, we could say, oh, that's the green push button or that's the uh, motor that's hooked up to the grinder, you know, you name it. So using tags instead of just random input output addresses makes things more readable in the program. So we'll stop there and we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks.